Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Boy, the frog just jumped in my throat. So it's good to see you. Um, and it's nice that uh, we're inside and we're not outside in the rain. What rain? Okay. And then we have a birthday. Um, a very famous person. Right on the front row. Denise has got a birthday tomorrow. Ooh. Isn't that great? Hey, Dwayne, that's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> Let's give her a round of applause. Okay, and then um, I don't have anything of, uh, as far as events go, but we do have some updates. And so I'll start with uh, Denise. If she wants to share about her niece, Amber. Um, it's quite surprising from last set Sunday when we talked about her being on my support. Okay, so go ahead, Denise and share. Good morning. So I have a wonderful praise. Thank you for all your prayers. Amber woke up on Thursday and they got her out of bed and walked her a little bit. And on Friday, they pulled all the tubes and took all the stitches out of her head and set it off. Wow. So she's, she's very weak on her right side, so she has to have help walking. And her memory is a little off, but other than that, she's still good. Sounds good. So thank you. Isn't that good? good? Wow. From last week to this week. What an answer. Okay, and then um, I'll share about Wendy. And then if I'm wrong or whatever, you can correct me. Karen is the authority on Wendy Atkins, what's going on because of their close, close friendship. But as far as we know, Wendy got the skin graft on her foot, and then she was having a compression bandage put on Thursday on it to help with the healing. And if everything goes well, she could be released tomorrow from the hospital. Is that still right, everything I said? Okay, so there's a possibility she might be released from the hospital tomorrow and then can get back to Congo where uh, the home is. So let's pray for Wendy. And then um, this one is, um, there's a volunteer appreciation banquet held every September for the people that volunteer in the Warsaw Jail. And so it's something that I attend every year with my wife because I'm a volunteer. And um, there at the uh, banquet, was one of the ladies that I had had in a Bible study. Back in the fall, the lady Bible study leader for the female inmates was hospitalized and was out. So the correction officer that I serve under, who schedules me when to come in and things, called me up and said, can you jump in there and, and do this? And I said, sure. So I go to the jail on Mondays and I have the men a Bible study with the men, and then in the fall I started having it on Thursdays with the women. And so at the banquet, there was a young lady there who I recognized right away from attending the Bible study. And uh, before the evening was over, she came right to me. And, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm rejoicing in the fact that she's out, and, and she said that she's in a Christian course right now to continue to help her defeat the drug addiction that's always caused her problems. And she looked very healthy and seemed to be on a great course. And she was very complimentary and encouraging of what she had received in the jail in the Bible study that she had attended. So her name is Amanda. So I put her on the prayer list to pray for Amanda that she'll continue to keep making positive progress in this effort to defeat drugs and stay on a straight and narrow course in Christ. So that was encouraging to see. It made my heart sing. Okay, and then I have a couple other um, prayer requests of a more serious nature. Um, Doug's sister, Judy Rogers. And some of you remember Judy when she was here uh, about the same time as Doug's mom was here. And so we saw Judy on a pretty regular basis. Um, 
Doug has informed me that she has been diagnosed with stage three lung cancer. And so starting um, this week, she'll be on radiation and chemo five days a week. And this will go for six weeks. And so the family members are preparing to uh, stay with her and do what they can to help her because uh, when you have all those things going on, it can really debilitate the body, the physical body. So um, she knew Doug would be mentioning to us about this, requesting prayer. So we will be praying for her and we'll get her on the prayer list by next week on the new one. So let's remember Judy and the family to this challenge. And then um, Marilyn Warner uh, shared with me this morning, her brother Robert Leach, he lives in Florida. He's been battling cancer for quite some time and now it's reached that stage of hospice. So he's entered into hospice care as of this past week. Um, the good news is, is that not long ago, he did trust in Christ. Amen. So he made a decision to trust in Christ. So that's going to be where he's going to see his Savior face to face. But they would covet prayers for this journey uh, as he goes through this hospice care. Okay, and then it's good to see Karen back with us in the back there after what she's been through. So glad to see you back. Okay. So I, that's all I have, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we again are grateful and thankful for um, our presence with you here and you meeting with us in this very special time. We are so thankful and grateful for how you continue to sustain us and use us in ways to uh, facilitate your grace and your goodness to others. And there's no better way of doing that often than praying, praying for those uh, around us, those that we know of. Um, we're first of all thankful for Denise having another birthday and being able to celebrate it tomorrow. We pray that it will be a very good occasion for her. And then we, Lord, think of in her family, uh, her niece Amber, and how things have turned around so dramatically since last weekend. Uh, we praise you, Lord, for being so kind and gracious to this young woman and enabling her to return home after what she's been through uh, throughout her stay in the hospital. So we are thankful for your grace. We would pray, Lord, for salvation to come to her also, that she will come to trust in Christ. And then we think of Wendy Atkins, our dear missionary in Africa, and what she's been through. Uh, we're Hoping and praying, Father, that she will be released tomorrow and she will be able to return to the Congo uh, in uh, where she resides. We would ask, Lord, that the foot would heal properly and that there would be no complications later. But thank you for the medical care that she received throughout this trial. And then, Lord, I think of the young lady, Amanda, who I was able to see again Thursday and renew that uh, friendship from being in the jail. Glad that she's out. We ask right now that you would help her um, in this journey in her life and her walk with you uh, to overcome drugs that have pulled her down for so long. For, it was so good to see her looking so healthy and, and uh, doing so well. And so Father, we pray you'll continue to sustain her in this journey. And then we do think of Judy Rogers. Um, we do finally remember her from the time that she was here with us. And we think about her even now as Doug has shared about his sister and what she's going through. Uh, we, we know, Father, you're, you're able to overcome anything, anything at all. And so we pray for the situation with the cancer in her lung, that these treatments would work successfully. We know that you can work through any means, and medical also. And so we would ask that you'd work through this medical means to uh, eliminate the cancer from her body. We pray right now, though, she's going to be going through a challenge physically because of these treatments. And we would ask that you would help her to be able to endure 
and we pray for the family members that are going to do whatever they can to assist her through this time and we pray that you'll give them strength to do all they can to be helpful and then father we do uh, think about robert leach we rejoice over the fact of his salvation that he trusted in jesus and that has made the journey towards the end hopeful rather than no hope so we think of him today right now going through this journey with hospice we would ask lord that you would help him to be able to remain in a comfortable condition and we look forward to the day that he'll be with you we pray for his family and extended family that you would sustain them through this change that's coming we give you glory honor and thanks for hearing our prayers and pray this all in jesus name Amen. all right we are going to sing hymn number 574 <clears throat> 574. I thought about this hymn in terms of what we're studying and really ministered and spoke to my heart, so I, think, I hope it'll speak to you. I thought about eliminating a verse or two, and then I thought, well, what verse would I eliminate? And I couldn't think of one, so we'll, we'll just sing them all. So join me in standing, hymn number 574. We'll sing the whole thing.
Okay, let's turn to number 585. Um, this is the song put to music. It's a good way of describing it. It's a song put to music. So many of the phrases are right out of us, right out of the songs. And uh, I think we're all familiar with it. But Beth, why don't you just play through? There's only two stages. Play through it just so we'll familiarize ourselves. chapter 2, I won't have you go anywhere else, so you'll be safe. Back in chapter 2, starting at verse 1, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. So as this prophet waits for God's answer, I'd say we're going to join him in that exercise. We're waiting for God's answer too. And his desire is to report God's answer to the righteous, who he represented in asking God about all the evil that was plaguing his country. We are just as eager as the righteous to see what the prophet will record for us to read. Now we learned that this prophet was told Babylon 
is being empowered to invade and to destroy his country, which definitely touched a raw nerve in his life. I mean, if we got the same message, God's plan is to destroy America, and it's right on the cusp of happening, we would feel the same way too. What? When? How? Why? And that kind of describes the prophet's feeling. He didn't like what he heard and questioned how God could use a wicked nation like Babylon to accomplish his work. And last week we began to see an introduction which God prepared for this prophet to record regarding the vision he received in response. So let's look at that part again, verses 2 through 4. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it, though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. So this response from God is to be displayed. We would say on a billboard for everyone to read and then to share with others. And what is the message that's to be displayed? Babylon will be destroyed in time. Now, it might seem like this will take a long time to happen. But the message is, don't give up on it. Remain patient, for it will happen on time and not a moment late. When Babylon conquers the prophet's country, it's going to look like they won, and all those who trusted in God have lost. But the opposite is true, according to God. You see, the Babylonians are filled with pride over their victory, but their souls are lost. If they gained the whole world, it wouldn't change the condition of their souls. But those who trust in God to be cleansed in their souls, here's the news, can't be defeated. And you might say, well, why is that? They have a victory that no person or circumstance can take away. Not cancer, not death, not a downturn in the stock market, not the loss of a job, not anything can defeat the victory that we can know through Christ. This victory will sustain them for the remainder of their lives, regardless of whatever happens on earth. It will sustain. So now, knowing that, what we have as righteous people, what do these conquering Babylonians have in comparison to the righteous? Well, look at verse 5. It's very interesting. Let's start with the first part. He says, indeed, because he transgresses by wine. What do they have? They've got wine. They've got wine to get drunk on. The Babylonians were notorious drinkers of wine, much like our country today consumes alcohol. Very similar. And Solomon wrote, Whose heart is filled with anguish and sorrow? Who is always fighting and quarreling? Who is the man with bloodshot eyes and many wounds? It is the one who spends long hours in the taverns, trying out new mixtures. Don't let the sparkle and the smooth taste of strong wine deceive you. For in the end, it bites like a poisonous serpent. It stings like an adder. You will see hallucinations and have delirium tremors. And you will say foolish, silly things that would embarrass you to no end when sober. You will stagger like a sailor tossed at sea, cling to a swaying mast. And afterwards, you'll say, I didn't even know it when they beat me up. 
let's go have another drink. The Babylonians are excessive in their appetite for strong wine. Now here's something to think about. Do the righteous need this to entertain their minds or to console their cares in this life? And the answer is no. Well, why not? We have the Lord. We have the Lord. But the Babylonians don't. Well, let's look at something else that the Babylonians have. Here in verse 5, it says, He is a proud man. The Babylonians are drunk with pride. And you might say, well, what does that mean? Here's a very simple statement. Solomon wrote, An evil man is stubborn, but a godly man will reconsider. The first example of a proud man in the Bible was Cain. He stubbornly refused to heed God's directions in worship. He stubbornly refused to listen to God's warning and counsel. Then he killed his brother out of jealousy. When God confronted him, he stubbornly refused to admit any knowledge about the death of his brother. Lastly, he complained about the consequences for his actions as being what? Too severe. And when given the choice, he freely chose to walk away from God for the remainder of his life on earth. The Babylonians stubbornly choose their way over God's way. And I have a great illustration from Daniel concerning the very last king of Babylon. Here's the account. Daniel answered, keep your gifts or give them to someone else, but I'll tell you what the writing means. Your majesty, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, who long ago preceded you, a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. He gave him such majesty that all the nations of the world trembled before him in fear. He killed any who offended him and spared any he liked. At his whim, they rose or fell. But when his heart and mind were hardened in pride, God removed him from his royal throne and took away his glory. He was chased out of the palace into the fields his thoughts and feelings became those of an animal, and he lived among the wild donkeys. He ate grass like the cows, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until at last he knew the Most High overrules the kingdoms of men and appoints anyone he desires to reign over them. I would say that was quite a lesson in humility, wouldn't you? And that took seven years to accomplish. That man was out in a field acting like an animal for seven years before God allowed him to come to his senses and realize, oh yes, God is in charge. Now, Daniel's not finished. He says, and you, his successor, O Belshazzar, you knew all this, yet, you have not been humble. For you have defied the Lord of heaven and brought here these cups from his temple, and you and your officers and wives and concubines have been drinking wine from them while praising the gods of silver, gold, brass, iron, wood, and stone, gods that neither see nor hear nor know anything at all. But you have not praised the God who gives you the breath of life and controls your destiny. What do we know here? Proud people don't learn from the truth. Why is that? They're just too stubborn. Well, again, look at verse 5. One more thing. And he does not stay at home because he enlarges his desire as hell, and he is like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all nations, and he heaps up for himself all peoples. The Babylonians are drunk 
with power. A familiar saying in our culture goes something like this. Power corrupts, and absolute power absolutely corrupts. The Babylonians can't stay within their borders because they have an unquenchable desire to exercise power over others. And you might say, well, what kind of power? It's destructive power. Like death exercises over the physical body, and like hell exercises over the soul. Death and hell won't stop in spite of how many victims they claim. The Babylonians won't stop destroying nations or individuals regardless of how many bodies they pile up as a result of their exploits. Hey, the depravity of mankind can always lead to extreme examples of sin when the soul is not right with God, as the Babylonians demonstrate. They are lost in their sins, and they keep pursuing what can't satisfy their souls. And in this example, it's wine, it's pride, and it's power. That's what they're after. And it will never satisfy their souls. They'll never be happy. The reward of the righteous is to enjoy relations with God in this life and to enjoy more of God into eternity. What do the Babylonians have to look forward to as a result of their course in life? Well, look at verse 6. God continues to say, Will not all these take up a proverb against him and a taunting riddle against him. Now, everyone will join together in deriding the Babylonians and creating songs about their downfall. Everybody's going to be doing it. And you might say, well, that's kind of odd. That's kind of strange. You mean nobody would be sad that the Babylonians keeled over and died? No. You see, they'll have no friends. They'll have no supporters in their time of weakness. No one will care for them when they lose their power. Now you might say, well, why will so many be united in their hatred of the Babylonians? Why would they be so united in hating these people? Look again at verse 6. God continues, and say, woe to him who increases what is not his. How long and to him who loads himself with many pledges. They extorted from others everything they could wring out of them. They forced other countries to bow to their demands or face the prospect of invasion. The pledges were payments demanded in return for continued safety. Now, as the, prophet, as the prophet cried out about the evil in his country, so now God is saying, now the countries are crying out, how long is this going to continue? What will bring this to an end? You can sympathize with the countries that are suffering in that plea. Look at verse 7. God goes on and he says, Will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will not they awaken who oppress you? And you will become their good. It's only going to require the combined forces of other nations living under this condition to finally break free. As it says here, suddenly they'll rise and oppress the oppressor. And then the Babylonians are going to be plundered like those they've exploited. And again, you come back and you ask yourself, well, why did this have to happen to Babylon? Why did it have to come to this? And look at verse 8. God explains. Because you've plundered many nations. All the remnant of the people shall plunder you. Because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city, 
and of all who dwell in it. They conquered so many nations that the survivors soon constituted a large, large force when combined. And all of the survivors were motivated to act as a result of what? Bloodshed and violence perpetrated on their countries. There were no parts of their countries which hadn't suffered in some way from the violence and the bloodshed. Basically, what we're learning here is this isn't the pathway to friendship. Well, it's the pathway to what? To war and revenge. What inspired the Babylonians to act so severely? Well, look at verse 9. The Lord continues. He says, Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. They were greedy. Greedy and lusting after the treasures possessed by others. They were greedy. Now, isn't this the same <coughs> desire that causes us to take advantage of others in seeking to have whatever another person possesses for ourselves? I mean, isn't this the motivation for robbery in small and in large ways? I see something somebody else has and I want it. The Babylonians found they could take whatever they wanted from others, and they just did. But soon, they began thinking, what will stop someone from doing this to us? So their reasoning was, hey, they tried to build fortresses for themselves in order to do what? Keep what they took from others. Now, how were all these treasures acquired? Look at verse 10. God continues. You give shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples and sin against your soul. They did this by telling themselves, it's okay to kill to get what you want from others. We often say to ourselves in this culture, it's okay to use what belongs to another person without their consent if you want to. They won't mind if I use it. The Babylonians were convinced even if they have to kill everybody in a particular location to profit from their possessions, then we just do it. And this desire certainly goes against the 10th command given by the Lord. You might say, well, what's the 10th command? Refresh my memory. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Folks, the farther they went, in this direction, the worse they became in acting savagely against their victims. I have to admit, it was pure by accident that this past week, I was flipping channels and I came across a PBS show documenting the Holocaust and the US and how the two intersected. And I watched all the programs, and it's horrible to see what the Nazis in Germany did. But then it dawned on me, who were the fathers to the Nazis? It was the Babylonians. This is what the Babylonians were doing in their time, what the Nazis were doing in this past century. That's the picture we have here. What evidence does God point to as proof 
of their sinful activity. Well, look at verse 11. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the timbers will answer it. Here's the scary thought. Their homes. If you want evidence of what they've done, just go to their homes. We're talking about the homes of the average citizens. The homes of the higher-ups. The homes of those in between. And what you'll find if you go into their homes is that they contain many things which didn't belong to them. If you only look around on the walls or at the ceilings, you'll find what? Evidence of the crimes. They can't deny their wrongdoing like Cain attempted to do because the evidence is too great to hide in their homes, in their very homes. It seems throughout the history of mankind that many have attempted to build empires. How did the Babylonians try to do this? Look at verse 12. God continues. Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity. Now folks, quite often it involves two actions that are closely related. I couldn't miss this watching the PBS show. I couldn't miss it. The desired locations, first of all, are cleared of all the previous inhabitants by bloodshed. Then, the work of building is accomplished by the enslaving of those who survive the bloodshed. That's how it works. The history of such empires, I think, can be traced back to the time following the flood. And here's the record. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. You know, I find it very interesting to consider their ancient desire in terms of making an empire. Let's just analyze it. Their desire was focused this way. It is Building a city means what? <clears throat> to consolidate power. It is making a monument to their ingenuity, which is a tower. It is gaining fame by establishing a recognizable name. When you hear that name, Babylon, the Babylonians, you know who they are. Their fame goes all over the Middle East. And finally, Rejecting God's authority to command them to do anything. It seems every empire has replicated that pattern through the generations that followed. Now remember what came of this ancient desire to build an empire? Here's the record. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. What does that mean? It says, Nothing of an evil nature will be restrained from them. You see, evil always seems to be greater when you have a group together. Maybe you can think back to your youth, and it was like, throw a rock through a window? I would never do that. But get with a group, and somebody says, hey, wouldn't it be cool to do that? And somebody else says, yeah. And you're in the group, and you're saying, we shouldn't do this, but you know what? You're in a group, and you just go along with it. That's what God is saying here. Come, 
let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, translated confusion, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. What they intended came to nothing by just a simple act of God in creating all the languages of the world. Now, if God were to visit Babylon in their height of power at this time, then what would happen? Look at verse 13. Here's a clue. God says, Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the peoples labor to feed the fire. And nations weary themselves in vain. You see, God is able to do again what he did before in bringing to nothing or to ashes all the combined labor of Babylon. The nations throughout time since the flood have labored endlessly to do what? To create a world empire. But these empires are founded upon sinful schemes. And what always happens in a sinful scheme? It always seems to disintegrate. Solomon wrote, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. What man has tried and failed to do will be accomplished by the Lord. As he expresses it in verse 14, look, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God is determined to fill the earth with his glory instead of what? Mankind's evil. And the reason for God's success is the kingdom to come will be founded on righteousness. Not wickedness as in Babylon. When we seek to build our own empires in life, it always comes to nothing. But when we give God the throne in our lives, then he always builds what is lasting. Jesus said, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundations on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. Now, folks, we only have to observe how others respond to a crisis to know if they are living with Jesus as the rock of their lives or not. You just have to watch. And you can tell who the person is that's on the rock and who the person is that isn't on the rock. How are we handling the rise of evil against us today? How are we handling it? Are we still trusting in Jesus as our rock as we watch the flood of evil do this, and the flood of evil starts doing what? Beating on this house. How are we doing? Are we still believing Jesus is the unmovable rock? Yes. Jesus said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Because this is the fulfillment of all of God's commands concerning our responsibility to one another. Now, the Babylonians didn't seem interested in this command at all, based on their conduct. Look at verse 15. Here's a surprising statement. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk, that you may look on his nakedness. 
Now, according to this description, they're only interested in one thing, exploiting their neighbors, exploiting their friends. We often say with friends like this, who needs enemies? Their chief aim is to take advantage of everyone. The closer you are to Babylon, the more vulnerable you become. They will stick the knife in your back whenever it is to their advantage. This is why King Hezekiah was scolded by Isaiah for being so naive when representatives from Babylon visited him. Now listen to the account. Isaiah wrote, soon afterwards, the king of Babylon sent Hezekiah a present and best wishes. For he had heard that Hezekiah had been very sick and now was well again. Oh, what a great thing to do. Hezekiah appreciated this and took the envoys from Babylon on a tour of the palace, showing them his treasure house full of silver, gold, spices, and perfumes. He took them into his jewel rooms too and opened to them all his treasures, everything. Then Isaiah the prophet came to the king and said, what did they say? Where are they from? From far away in Babylon, Hezekiah replied. How much have they seen, Isaiah asked. And Hezekiah replied, I showed them everything I own, all my priceless treasures. And Isaiah said to him, listen to this message from the Lord Almighty. The time is coming when everything you have all the treasures stored up by your fathers will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left. And some of your own sons will become slaves, yes, eunuchs, in the palace of the king of Babylon. Folks, that statement alone is scary. Because what does it mean? The human line to the Messiah will be in danger of ending. That's what God is saying. All right, Hezekiah replied, whatever the Lord says is good, at least there will be peace during my lifetime. And I just, I shudder to hear that godly king respond that way in such a weak and indifferent manner. How could you say that? I'm safe. I don't care about the rest of you. I'm okay. When an individual or a country takes on the nature of acting like a traitor to his friend, what is just? What is just? Look at God's answer in verse 16. You are filled with shame instead of glory. You also drink and be exposed as uncircumcised. The cup of the Lord's right hand will be turned against you, and utter shame will be on your glory. They're going to be exposed for who they truly are. Now the shame they've inflicted on others is going to be returned in a greater measure by God. Instead of being exalted, they have to live with contempt. The shame they are shown will never be removed. And we would use the word infamy here. Does anybody remember about a bombing in our country that is a day that will live in infamy? Oh, we guess. Why did it have to come to this? I mean, when you think of people and you think of their human beings, why does it have to come to this? Why does it have to turn out this way? Look at verse 17. Here's the reason. For the violence done to Lebanon will cover you, and the plunder of beasts which made them afraid. Because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and of all who dwell in it. You see, Babylon's extreme spoiling of others and of resources was very unnecessary in God's eyes. In their desire to take advantage of everything and everyone, 
They did great violence to God's creation. Lebanon was timber country involving many cedar trees. And what did they do? They went in there and they tore down the forests simply because they wanted to. And what about the wildlife that was inhabiting the forests? Oh, they just simply used them for their destructive desires, exploiting them every which way they could. And then they didn't stop there. They expanded their destructive desire to mass killing of people by spreading violence everywhere. Here's the point. They had to be stopped. So their duration was limited to a small fraction of time in comparison to other empires which came after them. God was not blind. He was not indifferent concerning the evil schemes they were putting out there in the world. So Babylon lasted 70 years. You know, I just watched that program. Nazi Germany lasted 12 years. Years because God had to do something. The Babylonians were empty in their pursuits and equally bankrupt when it came to what they trusted in. Look at verse 18. What profit is the image <coughs> that its maker should carve it? The molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols. What advantage is it to worship the product of our hands as if this could sustain us? The product of our hands. The Babylonians had traded in the true God for objects which had been carved or formed from molded metal. Those who claimed to speak as oracles for these objects only told lies. The object themselves could never say a word. A psalm writer says, they have mouths, but do they speak? Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet have they, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them, and so is everyone who trusts in them. They lack the ability to see or understand the fact that what? They're so deceived in their minds. God reveals how ridiculous they look to others. In verse 19, look at this. He says, Woe to him who says to wood, Awake! To silent stone, Arise! It shall teach! Behold, it's overlaid with gold and silver, and yet in it there is no breath at all. How foolish to cry out to objects of wood, stone, or precious metal as if they could respond. God says they aren't alive. As anyone can see, how easy is it today to ascribe to anything or to anyone the throne of our hearts? And how quickly we can become fools in worshiping whatever we give our hearts to. Gods are easily made in any generation depending on what, what you're willing to spend. Babylon was a land of idols. Judah has become a land of idols. And I'm sorry to say, but our country today has become a land of idols. Even though the prophet is living in a land of idols, with another land coming to destroy his country, the message of God is striking at the end. Look at verse 20, the last verse. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before it. Here's the conclusion of the whole matter, we would say. The Lord is still reigning from heaven. Amen. In the midst of all this turmoil at home where the prophet lives and in the world around him. And what is God saying from heaven? He's saying this. Shh. Uh, shh. Well, shh. Stop complaining. Stop doubting me. I'm not indifferent to sin. 
I'm not insensitive to suffering. I'm neither inactive nor aloof from the daily struggles on earth. I'm in control still. I will accomplish my purpose in my time. And his truth still remains right. As he declared it in verse 4. Verse 4. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him. But the just shall live by his faith. The proud are lost. They're lost in an empty pursuit. And they're going where? To destruction. They can't stop their downward fall. They're just going. But the righteous will not be lost in life nor in death with their faith in God. And what does that mean? Everybody who puts their trust in Jesus Christ has won. Amen. Has won. That's the message that God is trying to get across to the prophet and to us. You're not a loser. You're a winner if you know me. Let's bow our heads. God in heaven, as we come before you right now, we realize and recognize that the words recorded by the prophet are your words, as you dictated them specifically to him, concerning all the things that were on his heart and mind. As he struggled to understand your purpose in allowing such a wicked nation as Babylon to come in and destroy his country, you really reveal the fact that you judge evil, all evil, wherever it is. And the truth of the matter is that as Babylon would judge and would come in and be God's hands, your hands to judge that nation, so the same thing would happen to them. It would come. And their time on top would end abruptly. When we think about all these things that you described, Father, and how horrible and evil and wicked it is, we realize our only hope is to trust in you. You are our only hope. You are the only one that gives us life worth living. And if we start to get distracted by things or by resources or by whatever, we're losing sight that you are the most important in our lives. <clears throat> Father, we love you today. We, we again reaffirm the fact that you are our God and our Father, and your Son has saved us for eternity. <clears throat> oh, what a great and precious promise we have in you. So we pray this all in Jesus' name. Let's go to hymn number 506. I thought about these words as I was looking over that chapter 2 and couldn't get away from the words here of hymn number 506. Let's just sing the first verse and then we'll be done. Okay? So join me in standing. Let's sing that first verse.
thanks for the message you have instilled in our hearts today. We ask, Lord, that you continue to be with us, be our rock, Lord, that we can trust and obey your words and believe and know that you will take care of us. And we thank you for that. I ask also, Lord, that all the people that's on the healing uh, prayer list, we thank you for their healing, and we just hope, Lord, that all of those uh, have come to know you personally and believe and trust in you, Lord, and we thank you for that. I ask also, Lord God, that you bless each one here today who came to worship you and give you praise and glory and thanks for all that you would do with and for them. Be with us through our travels. Keep us safe, Lord God, and watch over us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.